tell us about your first court appearance. What thoughts, what emotions did you have going into that? Right, well, as far as I remember, the first court appearance was at Camberwell Magistrates, which is the sort of lowest level of court that you can appear in this country. And essentially what they decide is whether there's a case worth answering on behalf of the police or whether it should just be thrown out of court straight away. And if there is a case, um, at what level should it then be perhaps decided? Uh, they also have power, the magistrates, over whether you should be remanded in custody or um, released on bail, that sort of thing. So we turn up on uh, fairly early. We went in, because we were early, we went to find a small cafe which was just a short distance from the court. It was full of all the other defendants. And there was a whole pile of miserable looking men sitting around drinking, nervously drinking cups of coffee and, uh. and, and quiet mumblings because nobody was really in a very chatty mood. Um, so that was odd. It was also coincidentally for me the day after my father's funeral. So it was not a great event. I was just grateful that it wasn't on the day of my father's yeah. funeral. Because yeah. they won't stop for it, they just say, well, you'll have to miss it, or something like that, you know. I mean, Colin Lasky wasn't allowed to go to his mother's funeral. Oh, my gosh. Because he was in custody at that time, they were let oh. out. Oh, well, he's a dangerous criminal, you know. So, oh. um, so we were at this court. It was all very unreal, a bit like a dream. Um, half of the dream state was because a state of shock as much as anything because you're really not expecting this to be happening to you. You know, up to this point in your life, you've been a professional person dealing on a professional level with people, um, and you're used to being in control of things, if you like, in that sense. Whereas here, you have no control. So yeah. you've lost all control to these other people, all of whom you feel bear your malice in some form or other. Um, after a lot of argument, um, the magistrate decided we were safe enough to be released on bail. Um, I think the only proviso was that I had to... Um, no, I don't think they handed over my passport at that stage. No, they just had to, I just had to reside at the place I lived and not to talk to any of the other defendants, that was it. Um, so that was that. It was at that stage that... Um, they were asked how I knew I was videoing the tapes. And we said about, I recognised his voice. That was at that first court. So that was done. Because the conspiracy charge was there to conspire with others, it then automatically had to go up a higher level. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Having not been thrown out because the magistrate agreed there was a case to answer, so therefore it would go up. Um, so it went up. We went to another court then at Lewisham, I believe, a few months later, and um, much the same repeat, except this time the magistrate wanted to know some of the details of what we got up to, which, as my solicitor was telling me, he doesn't need to know any of that for this. He just wants a bit of juicy info to listen to. <laughs> uh, it's not relevant to what he's got to do. Mm. Uh, he wanted to remind us in custody. Um, but, amazingly enough, both the defence, which was expected, and the prosecution said they didn't think we needed to be in custody. You know, we're not going to run away, we're not the sort that's going to flee the country or uh, murder anybody in the interim. You know, so um, we weren't bound over, so then we were just um, uh, given some condition, bail conditions again and um, had to wait for the trial at the Central Criminal Court because we were told that's where it would be held because that's the biggest court, work most well known court there is. Yeah. Once you got to the Central Criminal Court, which is called the Old Bailey, yeah. you had to daily attend the court proceedings, isn't that right? That's right. Every day we had to surrender ourselves to the court, okay. which essentially meant signing in. We were then <coughs> in custody, which meant we then couldn't leave of our own free will. Um, and that's the status you're at when you're in court. That status stays the same throughout the whole time you're in the court. 
at the end of the day's proceedings, the judge, in his wisdom, then has to give you permission to be bailed until your next appearance, which oh would be like the following morning. Yeah. So, and that period is then counted as part of your detention period if you're found guilty. <clears throat> so if you're eight hours in court for like 10 days or something, that would be 80 hours worth of detention that you've already had. Oh, okay. That's how that works. Okay. So each day we had to attend this trial at the Old Bay. It, like, I think it lasted about a week or two. I really can't remember now. And partly why I can't remember is because the stress of all these daily trips and things got mm -hmm. to me completely. I was under very high doses of antidepressants. Uh, the most powerful of which at the time was lithium based. That was given to me by my doctor. That has to be actually medically watched and samples taken for levels and things. But it meant I was fairly much a sort of walking zombie at the time. So uh, I suppose that helps. But um, <coughs> it was incredibly stressful. And that felt even more unreal than the magistrate's courts because, of course, now you've got the barristers all chatting away and they're all talking uh, in legalese uh, and they refer to various books, learned books and precedences and some of our precedences went back to the eight, mid-1800s. Wow. You know, wow. because the law hadn't been erased in the interim. So they could use case history from any previous case, no yeah. matter how old as long as it's still on the statute, yeah. which the prosecution was doing quite regularly. And um, so we listened to all this stuff, they take us in turn, and it's obvious where myself and um, Colin and Tony fitted because we were up the sort of far end towards the end of most of this. So we started with what they considered was the lower level stuff. And of course, most of it, was not to do with me. Most of it was not to do with any one person it was okay. because it was 15 of us. Right. Um, and of course it took like forever. So for days you'd be there and it was nothing about you at all. Or what you'd done, it was all about these other folk. And the same for them, you know. So. Yeah. Um, but what I did remember was um, one of the um, court ushers or something saying, I don't know why you chaps are here at all, he said, from what I've seen and read, none of you should be here. And after that gave us a bit of encouragement, that's just a court official saying yeah. that. And um, but so it did drag on and on. Um, I did laugh at one point. One of the barristers, she was quite keen on talking about anal sex. Uh -huh. you know, and um, it just made me laugh. And the judge said, Excuse me, Ms. whatever her name was. Um, one of the defendants seems to find this funny and glowered at me. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh, sod you. And um, the judge was named Judge Rant, which was, oh. uh, we, we all decided was fairly well named. Um, it was very anti right from the word go. Anything that was in the press and so on was not considered relevant. Wow. And that includes the heavyweight presses that were more liberal in their approach and less judgmental than the tabloids because the tabloid stuff was oh they loved it of course because it was salacious and queers and um, yeah. torture and all the things that makes for a good selling of newspapers yeah. <laughs> but the more serious press times guardians these sort of people their um, stuff while having an element of that was much more balanced uh, and in fact tony and i were interviewed by the guardian came down here and did an interview with us and that was printed almost verbatim okay. uh, and that was pretty good <coughs> but none of what we wanted quoted out of any of these serious press was allowed by oh. the judge but we did couldn't help but notice that some of the stuff quoted in the tabloids managed to creep out in the um, uh, prosecution's case without being challenged so you know um, <coughs> we then got to the stage I don't know after how many days this was, <coughs> when we had to decide, having the evidence getting pleaded, did we want to plead guilty or not guilty, or did we want to reserve to go to trial okay. by jury? 
because that's another option, you see. Sure. So they hear all this stuff first, and then you have to make the choice. Are you now pleading guilty to what these charges are? Or do you want to plead not guilty and go to a jury trial? Well, I wanted to go to a jury trial, uh, as did Tony, actually. But we agreed, Tony and I and our legal teams, it would serve no purpose because of the videos. We knew that if the, if the general public saw these videos from a position of knowing nothing, they would be shocked. Hmm. Because they would be, you know, okay. just by the nature of them. It's not what your average um, sort of once a week with the lights out married couple would deem acceptable behaviour. And of course, the prosecution are allowed to choose the jury pretty much as well. Yeah. So um, we pleaded guilty on the advice of our legal teams, essentially. So that's where that got to. Hey. It was more than one offence, wasn't it? It was, wasn't well, it? It's a whole pile of them. Yeah, that I, yeah. That I uh, read out a few minutes ago. That yeah, was mine. And, that. and lots of the others had very similar sorts of things. They were all about actual bodily harm and um, grievous bodily harm and so on. Wow. Uh, I remember telling one of the blokes at work just after the case was in the papers, I said, oh, I've been charged with grievous bodily harm. And he said, What, you, Ronan? Yeah, you know, in that sort of quizzical voice. You've been charged with grievous bodily harm. He just couldn't see it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so that's where it all went. They just carried on with plodding through their stuff. Um, it's obviously going to be unsympathetic. There was no point in pleading not guilty. Because um, the other thing is, if you plead not guilty, go and go to trial with a jury. If you're found guilty subsequently, you get a longer sentence. Oh! And that applies in America and a lot of countries. It's to stop oh. people wasting court's time. Got it. See, it's saying that um, you knew full well you were guilty because you've just been found guilty. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you must have been wasting our time asking for a trial by jury. So we're going to dollop a bit more sentence on you. Well, as none of us wanted to go to prison anyway, we pled guilty. So that's where we ended up. Well, while you were, um, mm. I guess you were in the criminal court, yes. you went into the toilet and you saw graffiti mm. about one of the judges. Tell us about well, that. There's actually quite a lot of graffiti in the toilets. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> <laughs> not quite as good as in the cottage in days and not quite so much variety. But nevertheless, one that I liked in particular, um, it was only a written one, and it said, I wanted to be a high court judge, but my parents were married. Uh. <coughs> And what that interprets as all judges are bastards. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, that actually tickled me that. I rather like that. I, <laughs> I wanted to be a Thai court judge, but my parents were married. Um, but I have to say that the judge had no sense of humour whatsoever, but they don't. But then neither do consultants in hospitals have any yeah. sense of humour. You know, they're too busy being professional, I suppose. In their circumstances, I'd probably be just the same. So. <laughs> You received three one-year sentences to be consecutively served. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, again, as a rule of thumb, if you get more than one sentence for something, um, they're usually served all in one. So if you got a year, a year, and a year, you'd normally just serve a year. Okay. It, it would be concurrent. To be served concurrently is by far the norm in UK courts for sentencing. <coughs> but in my case, and um, I think Tony's, we got fairly short sentences that added up to three years and three years plus. Okay. And the judge said they had to be served consecutively, which meant we got three years instead of like six months. So, I mean, that was a nasty little aside. I mean, okay, they have the power to do that, but why do it? Yeah. You know, if it's not been vindictive, uh, perhaps even vindictive is the wrong word, just didn't like us. It said at one point when the judge looked at the videos, which was a closed court day, meaning the public weren't admitted that day, right. <coughs> we didn't have to go if we didn't want to. And I didn't go, not because I was ashamed of the videos, but I knew I couldn't stand them in that situation, yeah. Yeah. knowing how his lordship would be feeling. He said he, it made him feel physically sick, and the policeman said the usual sort of things like we were deeply shocked 
and it never ceases to amaze me how deeply shot policemen can get. I mean, I, I watch these crime series on the and digital channels these days, and they're always deeply shocked. Now, to be fair, some of the stuff they see and come across is deeply shocking. Yeah. But for someone that's been with the job for years and years, it would take a lot to be deeply shocked. I mean, I should have thought a butchered child or something would make you deeply shocked. Yeah. Not someone whacking someone else's ass with a leather strap, you know. <laughs> and um, <coughs> do, you, do you think perhaps that's just the vernacular that they tend to use? Oh, I think so. Yeah. It, it, it looks yeah. good in print. Yeah. And the other thing they, they often say, um, when um, reporters say, which they're told by the police, <coughs> to every question so-and-so said no comment, and that's used against you as somehow you're not cooperating with them. Oh. In the media, it appears that you're not cooperating because you must be guilty. Yeah. Right? Whereas actually, <coughs> it's nothing to do with that. It's to do with the fact that in law and on the advice of solicitors, you don't have to say anything. Yeah. So why should you? It's up to them to prove it. You don't have to say a word. It doesn't that's mean right. you're not cooperating. You'll, have, you'll happily answer every question with no comment. <laughs> So that's yeah. another little way they put a slight twist on things when reporting it to make it seem worse. I always used to say that um, a straight couple having sex in the dark uh, once a month in their own bedroom would be made to sound obscene in a court. Because yeah. it's the way barristers work. Barristers yeah. are there, especially prosecution barristers, to tie you in knots and make you come across as absolutely appallingly as possible. Yeah. That's another reason I wasn't keen on a trial by jury, because I knew I'd get wrapped in knots instantly. By a barrister. And not the good way, yeah. No. And um, <laughs> so that was, I mean, at work, I always used to um, write down my strategies for particular projects and things, have a notebook with them all in. Everything was ordered um, so that I knew where I was at. If I was caught on the hop doing ad libbing stuff, like when I'd give, um, I don't know, lectures to people in the forces that want equipment, we were giving them. Um, sometimes it got a bit of a muggle. Yeah. Nothing serious, but enough that I couldn't order my thoughts properly. So embarrassing was. He'd have had me hung, drawn, and quartered within a few seconds, I should think. <laughs> so my gosh. That's where we're at with that. Um, yeah. Well, tell us about your incarceration in the Old Bailey. And mm. for the benefit mm. of the North American audiences, yeah. would you please? Again, explain Old Bailey. I mean, of course, I understand, but someone else viewing this may not understand what that means. Right. In, like most countries, there are levels yeah. of courts. For very minor misdemeanours, um, you can be tried by a JP, which is a Justice of the Peace, yeah. which is basically a lay person with no legal training who can do the kids who go shoplifting and this sort of thing and yeah. people running over people with their bicycles, all the really low level, not really, act, well slightly antisocial but that's yeah. the lowest level. Uh, the JPs are elected and appointed by judge, um, magistrates who are the next pile up and the magistrates court is the lowest proper court or you have a juvenile court, that's a different thing altogether. <coughs> um, and then above the juvenile courts you have the crown courts there's usually one per county or whatever we've got. Okay. Um, there's a Crown Court in Hartford, there's a Crown Court in St Albans, there's Crown Courts over most big towns. Uh, they deal with most of the rest of the stuff. Anything that's considered particularly notorious and um, dodgy can, can go up the top of the Crown Court pile, although it's if legally still the same thing, um, is the Old Bailey, which is the Central Criminal Court. Okay. That's the one that you, is famous in pictures with the lady holding scales in one hand and the sword of justice in the other, yeah. you know. And um, <laughs> so that's the, the main one. Now, that people always think of that as a court, but actually there's about 12 or 13 courts within it. So oh, I see. You can appear in, depending how many you are and what yeah. cases you end up in different ones. Okay. Um, once you've signed in, when you come in, I said you um, surrender yourself to the court, you're then taken down to the cells. The cells are, and they have bars on them and things, a bit like the American ones, these, with the open bars. Yeah. Uh, and you're in a room there with other defendants all waiting to be called to your various courts. Um, and then you get taken up and sat in the 
jury box, not the jury box, the, um, what was I? Not the witness, the... Um, defendant. The Thank defendant. you, the defendants. Yeah. <laughs> that voice off camera, sorry about that. That's all right. Yes, so they, when they take you from the cells, you're taken upstairs into the courtroom where you're put in the defendants area, which in our case was quite large because there was 15 of us, which as I said, most of us didn't know most of the others at that time. Yeah. Um, and you listen to all your evidence from there. Unlike the American system, which I have to say I prefer, you don't sit next to your counsel. So if you want to say something to them when they're doing their talk on your behalf, you have to try and get the, atten the attention of um, an attendant, court attendant, pass him a note. Yeah. He takes the note to your barrister, whoever it is, they pass it back and so on. And um, that's how that works. And at the end of the day, the judge says whether well, you can go home or not, and it all carries on for the next day. So take us through the findings of the courts and, and how things progressed. What, what happened? Okay, once we had been found guilty, or once we pled guilty, mm -hmm. then the judge then adjourns the court for two or three days or a week to get what are called reports on you. So they then ask for reports on the various defendants as to their mental state, physical state, what other things they might have. The judge has access to all previous convictions and so on, of which I had none. Mm -hmm. and in fact, most of the people there, certainly Tony and Colin had, I think actually Colin turned out did have one, but most of us had no previous things. So they then weigh that all up and then the judge on his own then decides what sentence you get. So then the judge calls you all to stand one at a time. He then passes his sentence, which in my case was three times one year, equals three. As soon as that's announced, you're taken back down to the cells and you are then um, transported off to the prison, whichever okay. one they decide. Uh, in my <coughs> case, and um, in fact, all of us, I think, that went to prison, we all went off to Brixton. Ah, let's see. Um, and so we're in these white vans that you see on British news with the darkened windows and the uh, you could see people's flash guns firing through the dark glass to try and get a picture and the interiors are all moulded um, oh, what's the bloody stuff? Uh, fiberglass. Ah. Well, the interiors are all moulded fiberglass Everything's smooth, horribly slippery, so you nearly crash about every time you go around a corner. Oh my God! So they then wheel you, get you into the prison. Uh, on arrival, you go to reception, where you're uh, made to strip everything off, and then you get examined by some nerdy prison officer um, who checks that you haven't got anything nasty secreted anywhere you shouldn't have. Mm. So that's a bit demeaning, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, there's a one thing being in a scene with people and enjoying messing about. It's entirely different when some sort of nerk of a prison officer starts yeah. messing you about. Um, <coughs> after that, you then um, hand over all your goods and chattels. They give you a pile of prison stuff. Um, they find out what medications you're on, if any make a note of those for the prison doctor um, and then it's off to your cells and then they put two of you go in the cell, lock the door and that's it then you just have to contemplate for a while and then um, after we, I went in with one of the other defendants after a while some fairly young prison officer come in um, he tried the old threatening style you know uh, you just do what you told or I'll sort you out and this that and the other and I thought he's just, I'll just do what he says it's no odds to me if he wants me to stand up sit down or sit on my hands or put my hands on me. why should I care you know I'm not gonna cause a fight over that I thought that's the only power you've got over me if I just do what you say you haven't got any power over me so yeah um, I just did what they said and took no notice of him basically um, but Brixton was pretty horrible it was overcrowded which apparently is even worse these days wow. and um, the food was disgusted oh I'm glad I wasn't around during World War II because the first meal we had was dried egg <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever tasted dried egg well, it's, it's powdered egg they yeah. dehydrate eggs um, turn them into a sort of pulp 
put them in trays, bake them, and then you get this sort of rubber. Yeah. Uh, it's dried egg, and it's, oh, it's disgusting. Prison food was revolting. And, um, but in a while, we were on Rule 43. Now, that's for sex offenders and um, child molesters and this sort of thing. It's what the other prisoners call nonces. That's the people who are not deemed to be proper nice prisoners oh, like they are because they're only like murderers or, um, uh, what do you call it, burglars or mm -hmm. fraudsters or something. <coughs> so you're segregated. And, of course, gay people aren't welcomed in prison anyway. Right. So Rule 43 was all right because it meant we were safer on Rule 43. Uh, and within a few days you get into a routine. So that wasn't too bad. Um, but uh, they transferred me away from someone I knew into with some other Indian bloke. Sat me in his cell. I got all, most of my stuff nicked because I didn't know that every time people come in the cell they take whatever they can find. Uh, so things that mattered in those places like toothbrushes and toothpastes, these essentials of everyday life, they, they disappear just after you bought them because you have to buy them. Wow. Uh, you can get earnings um, and if you do jobs you get earnings and you get paid in tobacco which is I didn't smoke when not used to be. So, uh, <laughs> so you would then trade that so off? So that's what thing. you're supposed to do, trade them. Yeah. Oh, okay. But there was a, a really sort of definite an air of menace about Brixton. Uh, if people said the wrong things in the wrong places, you know, it likely to get duffed. But um, I could pretty much talk my way out of most situations. So well, I used to be quite good at it, um, college and places like that, you know. You might know, so I do chunter on a bit. So, And if you can make them laugh, you can generally stop them attacking you. <laughs> well, you did say that you lived with an overall sense of menace. Yes, there was, so, nevertheless, because yeah. I had always been afraid of being beaten up and assaulted and things. I wouldn't have gone well with that. Did anything like that happen? No. Okay. Got Thank close you. a couple of times. One occasion, this was in a different prison, and later, uh, my cellmate sort of told the bloke to shove off in effect. And then um, that was that diffused. But I did help people. Um, this was more in the second prison after the, because I got out on bail <coughs> from the first thing. And I remember the, barrier, the solicitor saying to me, um, if you're granted bail, the chances are you won't go back in because they don't like to readmit people who they've granted bail to, having been in a. He got that wrong. He got everything he said virtually wrong. Um, he said he was a criminal barrister, a criminal solicitor. I said, oh, you're not that bad. Uh. <laughs> But, um, so that was something else that was wrong. But you were very isolated then, there were no phones. You yeah. didn't have phones in the first one. Um, visits were, you had to apply for visits, your letters were obviously all read in both directions, both going out and coming in. Sure. Um, and it wasn't a particularly pleasant place. It, only the um, toilet facilities at that time were just a bucket in the corner. Um, plus an open sort of toilets with no doors a bit further down the thing. The place to be aware of, to be wary was in the exercise yard because that had that was all enclosed as well and that exercising was separate from the other prisoners <laughs> so you didn't get duffed by them because you're a nonce. And um, <coughs> for people like Tony and I, son who really had come from professional background, this was a, a whole unknown world that we'd never been part of. Sure. Or even. Sure. Yeah, it's not as though we'd grown up through the system like a yeah. lot of them had. Yeah. <coughs> and the, the, ex the, um, the exercise yard was particularly dangerous because that had a, a toilet block, but it was open in at both ends, so you could sort of stroll through it. So if they wanted to do any harm to anybody, they'd nudge them into the toilet block, do them harm, and then come out the other side. Oh. Um, but I applied for bail, and I said I didn't. No, my solicitor said, why don't you apply for bail? I said, well, I don't want it if I'm going to go back.